ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Angela Svent, I'm director of the Center for Eurasian, Russian, and East European Studies here at Georgetown University. And I am delighted to welcome you here tonight. Thanks for coming out on this frigid, frigid night. Uh, but we have a stellar panel here tonight. So I know that you will decide at the end that it was very much worth your while. Um, and what we're doing is we're discussing the second edition of a very well-received book that they've written. And at this point, I would like to hold up a copy for you, but they haven't arrived yet. Um, so you will see it um, hopefully when, you, uh, when we're done with this and you'll be able to purchase some copies of the book. Um, but, um, uh, and the book is edited by uh, Jan Politsky and David Goldwyn. And uh, it deals with, it's called um, Energy and Security, and it deals really with a wide variety of global energy issues, which they're going to talk about tonight. Um, it's a very timely book if you just think about a few things that are in the news every day. Uh, the U.S. shale revolution and its uh, implications really globally, very unexpected uh, and continuing implications. Um, there's the Iran deal that may be on the horizon that could have a major impact on uh, the global energy situation. Uh, the ongoing turmoil in the Middle East, obviously, and in Ukraine. And I know we're going to talk about Ukraine tonight as well because that too has major implications uh, for the global energy system. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce you to the four members of the panel, and then I'm going to have each one of them speak, um, and then we can have your questions and answers, and I'll introduce them all now. Uh, and then we will start, first of all, with David Goldwyn. He's president of Glo Goldwyn Global Strategies. He served as Secretary of State Hillary Clinton's Special Envoy and Coordinator for International Energy Affairs. He's been Assistant Secretary of Energy for International Affairs. He's been National Security Deputy to the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Chief of Staff to the Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs. He is a non-resident senior fellow at, Brookings, at the Brookings Institution. He is a member of the National Petroleum Council and an alternate member of the U.S. Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative Steering Group. Our second speaker will be Jan Kalitsky. He is a senior scholar at the Woodrow Wilson Center and at the Kennan Institute. He's the chairman of the Eurasia Foundation. He's a counselor for international strategy at Chevron. He has served in the White House as the NIS Ombudsman. He's been counselor to the US Department of Commerce in the Clinton administration. He was on the State Department's policy planning staff serving Secretaries Kissinger and Vance. Uh, and he was chief uh, foreign policy advisor to Senator Edward Kennedy. Uh, he's also taught at a number of universities, including Georgetown, but also Brown University, Harvard, Princeton, and the London School of Economics. Our third speaker is Julia Nene. She's a director for Russian and Caspian Energy at IHS, where she provides clients with risk analysis for investments in the oil and gas industry. Uh, she worked closely with her clients identifying the uh, political and economic risk for the oil and gas sector in countries from the ground up. She has in-depth contacts inside those countries, uh, including <clears throat> uh, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Iran, Kazakhstan, Russia, Turkmenistan, Turkey, Ukraine, and Uzbekistan. And our final speaker will be Professor Brenda Schaefer. She's a specialist on energy and foreign policy, energy security policies, Azerbaijan, the Caucasus, Caspian energy, and Eastern Mediterranean energy issues. Uh, she's a visiting researcher at Ceres at our center at Georgetown. She's also taught a course here on Caspian energy. Um, she's on sabbatical from the University of Haifa, where she's a professor in the School of Political Science. Uh, so um, I think we will begin first with you, David. Would you like to stand up, or are you going to speak I'll from I'll speak from here, okay. uh, if right. you all can, can hear me in the back. Sure. First of all, uh, thank you, Angela, and thank you, Brenda, for, for hosting this event for us. It's nice to be back on campus, College 81, um, uh, and, um, and also we're really honored, um, Jan and, and Julie and I, to be with such leading scholars in this field as, as the two of you. Um, this book that we uh, are not holding up right now, Energy and Security, is the second edition of, uh, of, uh, of a book that Jan and I have, uh, have edited with such leading lights as Dan Jurgen, who you may have heard of, um, uh, a guy named Ernie Moniz, who's, uh, who's doing some work in our Department of Energy right now, um, and a variety of people, Republicans, Democrats, OPEC, non-OPEC, uh, Americans, and, and people from around the world. And the, the common theme of this book 
is that the U.S. energy landscape has changed, but neither the public nor policymakers have really caught up with that change. And after 40 years of energy dependency, it's hard for people to accept that we have surpluses of oil and gas, maybe even exportable surpluses, and even harder to process what that means for foreign policy. Uh, long story, and long story short, and it is a long story because the book is about 800 pages, uh, is that we think, and many of our contributors think, that this new self-sufficiency, um, if we embrace it, two, two, two questions there, offers the United, chance, the United States the chance to help make oil and gas markets more competitive, to help climate change by driving the substitution of gas for coal worldwide, to reduce the impact of supply disruptions around the world, both by increasing production here and propagating our technology abroad and democratizing access to energy, and creating linkages rather than competition, both with producers and with consumers. And we think this will happen not by energy independence, which to the extent people define energy independence as autarky, we think is both um, an unhelpful and even a, a dangerous concept, but by interdependence, by connecting to global markets, by propagating our technology, by building collective responses, and reducing everybody's dependence on oil, not just those in the United States. So in, in his time, Jan is going to explain the, the system that we propose, a global energy security system. But I want to talk about the insecurity part of our title today, which is, um, thank you. Oh. There's the tone. Now you can wave it around. <laughs> a sign reading we hope in somebody's class here at George Um So I want to talk about why this energy boom in the US is so important because of the kind of insecurity that we're going to see in the Middle East in the future, the insecurity we're seeing now, and something which I think will continue for, for, for quite a while to come. So just to survey the terrain uh, a little bit, Three of the four greatest sources of oil supply disruption that we saw last year came from the Middle East. <clears throat> Those were from Iran, Libya, and Iraq. Nigeria was number four. So how does it look? Libya, down about a million barrels a day, having a national dialogue and a constituent assembly, probably a year away from appointing the people who will decide the constitution, which will draft the laws that will rule the country. Security, um, uh, really, um, non-existent right now, no national forces. Libya is just building a nation, but their supply is offline, not likely to come back for a while, certainly not likely to grow, I think, for, for quite a while. And most of US engagement now is in trying to provide um, training for basic security. So, so that's for Libya. Algeria, an aging leadership, President Bouteflika probably will be reelected. But Algeria, in the best of times, had trouble <coughs> attracting more investment given the terms that it had on offer. Its own political consensus makes it a, quite, a, quite a challenge, so companies are exiting Algeria. So the prospect for new investment, not good there either. Egypt, under force majeure, the subsidies are uh, basically screwed up all the oil production. Now it seems they won't be a gas exporter either. So uh, Fareed Mohammadi, uh, one of our contributors, said uh, this, this part of the world, which everyone thought was the source of the next great oil supply, which was the hot place to be five years ago, basically a non-strategic factor for the future. <coughs> so move to the southern Gulf, Saudi Arabia, the only country in the southern Gulf that is investing in oil supply, but its domestic consumption is growing. It's uncertain whether prices are going to go up or down, whether Iraq is going to come into OPEC or not, and therefore whether it's wise or prudent to be investing in greater oil production as opposed to cutting back production to elevate price. Um, the uh, uh, the spare capacity, still mostly in Saudi Arabia, is about 2.2 million barrels a day. That's pretty thin in an 80 million barrel a day world. So uh, you've got succession issues, not much of a cushion. <coughs> UAE, Kuwait, basically not investing. So not a lot of growth there. The northern Gulf, you've got Iraq internally divided, um, basically limited by the existing infrastructure that it has. And you have uh, the Kurdish region of the north, which has a terrific regime for attracting investment. And it thinks it's going to do a deal with Turkey to export that. But my own view is that that's highly unlikely for a while to come. Turkey is not about to cut Baghdad loose. The Kurds are not going to cut off the, the cash flow that they have from the capital anytime <coughs> soon. And Iraq is quite vulnerable, um, both from uh, the Sunni insurgency, which is growing. And Syria has had ex an extremely negative effect on the whole region. The Kurds are emboldened, and the Iraqis are more fearful that any grant of sovereignty that they give is likely to lead to more disaggregation of the country. 
Iran, which we'll talk about more in the Q&A, is probably the biggest wild card. <coughs> uh, things go bad. We're looking at a significant disruption in the Persian Gulf, maybe military action. Prices near $140 and probably limited exports by a lot of others. On the other hand, if you have a deal with Iran, the production comes back on even slowly, then you're going to have an earthquake in the energy industry. All of our Caspian policy was to get around Iran. Iranian gas could flow to other countries. Iranian oil would be the hot place to invest if they didn't agree to, to reasonable terms. <coughs> so you would have um, a, a war inside OPEC. As Iraq maybe comes back into OPEC, Iran decides it wants more quota, and the Saudis have to decide how much they're going to lose national revenue to make room for the others. Um, so our, our um, uh, Rod Akhadiri and Robin, Robin West, who wrote our, um, our chapter on the Gulf, um, think that there are enormous pressures on them, both for budget um, and for investment. So we're not looking at a lot of stability in that region. And, and lastly, with respect to, to OPEC, Ed Morris and Amy Jaffe, who wrote the chapter there, look at all these issues and U.S. production, Canadian production, <coughs> biofuels, flat demand, and say the Saudis are going to have a heck of a time creating discipline when they've got to make room for an Iranian adversary, an Iraq that wants to come in with five million barrels a day for, for quota, and have to raise money for their own economy as well. So our, our conclusion here is that while you have this enormous insecurity in the Middle East, this is actually a bit of an opportunity for foreign policy because our ability, the US ability, to provide oil and gas to the market overall creates a way for us to reach out to the Asians because the Middle East affects Asian physical supply of energy. For us, it's a price issue, but for them, it's physical supply. So the last couple of years, we were able to do Iran sanctions because our production, Canadian production, pretty much entirely made up for what came offline in Iran and Libya. What would it mean if we could directly export gas to Japan? What would it mean if we could directly export oil to, to Korea and to Japan? How much more appealing would our sanctions policy be, would our foreign policy be, if we were able to not just exhort people to follow it, but were able to provide direct help? So this kind of common cause with Asia on security our also ability to help the, the Saudis use something other than oil for electricity. And we have lots that we can do with each of these countries while they are insecure to help them work better, but basically to give us tools for foreign policy. So, um, so that's, uh, that's really the, the, you know, a, a little teaser for our, for our, uh, for our thesis. But um, as much as there's a crisis worldwide, we now have the ability to help ourselves. And the question really is, from a policy point of view, whether we're willing to do it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, many thanks again, uh, Angela and Brenda, uh, for hosting us here at the uh, Wardara Center in Georgetown. It's great to be back. I uh, see many old friends and co colleagues here, and I, I remember enjoying tremendously my teaching stint here some good years ago. It was really uh, a highlight. Um, when we uh, began work on the second edition, uh, our authors and we were just talking about revising and updating and you know doing a little bit of this and a little bit of that and there we'd be all set. And then we looked at how the world of energy has changed since our first edition in 2005. And it's been a major revamp. I mean it really has because uh, all of the changes in the landscape, uh, the tremendous surge in production here in North America, uh, the blurring of the lines uh, between producers and consumers. Producers now are consumers. Consumers are producers. Uh, the landscape changes that David has described. And, and what I'd like to do is uh, just talk about a couple of the issues that arise in the Russian Eurasian area. Julie and I co-authored uh, the chapter on Russian Eurasia, but Julia, since hopefully you'll cover some of the detail, I don't want to take oh, don't worry. take the <laughs> steam out of stuff. it. But I do want to highlight a couple of of issues there, and then turn to some more of the uh, what we're calling the global energy security strategy approach in the book. And then I, I really look forward to the discussion and, and engagement rather than our simply being talking heads. Uh, so on Russia and Eurasia. I'd like to make just a couple of observations. Uh, the first is that the economic and political dependence on energy has certainly not been broken in Russia, nor for that matter in other CIS producers. The consequence is that even a small reduction in price could be a big blow first to places like Moscow, Astana, Baku, even Ashgabat, that seems somehow to exist in its own bubble. 
<laughs> uh, these could be hit quite hard. And it would be politically quite consequential if these changes were to occur at a time of leadership change in any of these countries. And, and over and over again, when we look at this, uh, we have resisted dealing with energy just as energy. We have said, look, an integrated approach where energy and foreign policy and climate and economy, national security, should be brought together. And we cannot afford to do this simply as an island, you know. Here, we in the U.S. decree that we will have an energy policy separate from the rest of the world. We have to be very, very conscious of the changes in other countries uh, and of the fact that the market in oil is a consolidated market, of course, and the market in gas is increasingly so. But getting back to the Russia-Eurasia area, the, uh, the vulnerability uh, of the regimes is high in the energy field, and their margin is very limited in terms of price increases. Uh, I would argue much more so, for example, than, say, the Gulf, uh, where the Saudis have more latitude relative to Russia and Eurasia. And uh, that's strategically, I think, quite consequential. I also thought it would be useful to talk a little bit about Ukraine, but I hope there will be a rip-roaring discussion of that uh, with, with all of you, because it's, it's underway. And uh, it's underway not only in Ukraine, but uh, less visibly, less reported in other parts of the former <coughs> Soviet Union, uh, places like Belarus and Moldova, which have been exposed to huge pressures. And I think that has enormous consequences for the independence of the post-Soviet states. Uh, thinking back to my time in the Clinton years, uh, one of the great objectives that we had was to make sure that we supported the economic and political independence of the post-Soviet states. And their access to world energy markets was and is a key factor. Yes, we were also concerned about going around Iran, but independently of that, we felt that it was a, a critical factor to make sure that these countries did not have to depend on transportation through Russia and could somehow access the international market, which is why, for example, we spent some more time on the Baku Tbilisi Chehan pipeline. I vividly remember the primary corporate sponsors at that time thinking that these ideas were ridiculous, quote, strategic ideas. Whenever you say strategic in the corporate world, people reach for their wallets. Uh, <laughs> So there, there we were with Sandy Berger, uh, and I, I'm sure you wouldn't mind this story one bit, and with the senior people uh, from VP, and we explained to them just how important it was that if there was any chance of their being involved, they get, better get involved sooner rather than later as a lead investor uh, in the uh, BTC. Now having said that, ironically, a uh, company that I spent time with, Chevron, has become the lead after VP through a, con a series of consequences of mergers, actually, so that you really have a, a major British role, but also an important American role, and there are other companies involved as well. So the idea was to put together the foreign policy and the strategic policy with the uh, commercial engagement, and to interact effectively with our investors, and also with the countries in which we were investing, who had a crucial desire to uh, ensure their own independence. I mean, when you think of uh, Gaidar Aliyev, whatever one thinks about his repressive politics, which were uh, uh, extensive, shall we say, uh, he understood from the get-go how important it was to get his oil and gas produced and to make sure that it was piped out, not through Russian territory. Same thing for President, President Nazarbayev. I mean, this is a crucial issue for them in terms of their own independence and autonomy. Now, why is this all important? Because in recent years, there's, there's been a progressive lessening of that energy independence on, on the part of these states. And dramatically, we see in the Maidan Square in Kiev a drama unfolding uh, between return to a neo-Soviet orbit or reconnection to the West. But this drama is also unfolding in similar ways, not as acute, in other parts of the post-Soviet space. And it's interesting to see how easily even robust 
countries in that region, relatively so, uh, can be pressured through energy and energy instruments. And just think about it. A $15 billion <coughs> Russian credit and reduced gas prom prices, which any time can be increased, were key levers used to disrupt Ukraine's pending economic agreement with the European <coughs> Union. So this is a critical point where the country of Ukraine, which was on a path in the direction of increased association, economically so, and over time hopefully otherwise, uh, with Europe and the West, through uh, its economic vulnerability, and especially its energy vulnerability, has been moved in the other direction. Now, obviously, this is not the whole story. I mean, the drama of <coughs> Yanukovych and Timoshenko and all of that, you know, uh, the opponents and the crowds in the street. I, I recently saw The Square, which is all about the Egypt the Egyptian drama. And every, all the time I was thinking, well, it, it, it is a different region, but what about the other square, you know, in Ukraine? Now, think again about American policy here. If you compare the strategic importance of a Ukraine with, say, an Afghanistan, sorry to say, uh, it's sobering to realize that 1.5 1 to, 1 to, say, 3% of our funding for Kabul could have matched the offer that President Yanukovych felt that he could ill afford to refuse from President Putin. Quite a comment, I think, on U.S. strategy since 2001. It's not to say that money is everything, but I think we had, had and we still have, arguably, and I, I would encourage discussion on this, an opportunity to act as real partners and allies with Europe to make a difference in places like Ukraine, which can either go right back into the old uh, orbit or can, you know, uh, slowly and, and in a difficult way develop their relationship with the West. And I would argue that this is especially important because in Russia itself, changes are going on. Uh, Yes, Mr. Putin has been there a long time, and he'll be there for a good long, long time later from now. But there are changes going on within Russia, uh, not only in terms of um, readiness to oppose power in ways that are quite stunning and, and, and courageous, but in terms of the economy itself, where you know the old monopolies, the Gazproms of Russia, and the increasing Rosnefts of Russia, which are sort of taking over the gas and oil space, are being challenged in very fundamental ways. Uh, what am I talking about here? I'm talking about the fact that in uh, gas monopoly Russia, uh, Gazprom is unpleasantly finding that there's a country called Novatech, a company called Novatech, which also has its supporters high up in the Kremlin, and which is taking up a lot of the space internally. Uh, in the case of Rosneft, yes, it has a very important sponsor. It's expanding in its strength in Russia. But there's also a company called Gazpromneft, which actually is uh, semi-independently run, which is also competing internally. And you add to that the external competition that Russia is facing. Remember, in this area of energy, which is crucial to the stability of the country, which <coughs> covers uh, a very substantial part of the budget of that country, uh, which accounts for a very high part of the GDP of that country, it is finding tremendous uh, counter pressures from European insistence on competitive rules in its space and from Chinese insistence uh, on uh, uh, not agreeing to these high prices that Gazprom wants to get for its uh, gas and finding alternative sources, uh, including Turkmenistan, to supply that. So, so here we are. We have increasing struggle within and outside of Russia. We do have a very strong uh, uh, government there which is seeking to restore more of the aspects of the old system. And we have countries like Ukraine, which, in which the population has uh, uh, been uh, more and more strongly opposed to the governments of the government, to the policies of the government, even in eastern Ukraine, where demonstrations are occurring now. And what do we do? For 1.5 to 3% of what we paid in Afghanistan, we do nothing. 
relatively speaking. And I think that's very strange. And I would welcome any comments on that. Now, let me close. Uh, I said a lot about that, but I really feel passionate about this part of the world, as you can see. Um, uh, David pointed out that uh, uh, we have a, a little strategy. Uh, we're calling it a, a global uh, energy security strategy. Uh, guess, not yes, uh, but guess. Uh, and going for guess is a matter of, it has several, we have a list of, of particular measures, which I will not inflict on you uh, right now, but the critical point that we're making in guess is that there's, there should be no such thing as an independent national energy security strategy. Uh, we've tried that for a good 40 to 50 years, and we failed here in the US anyway. We can't pull together a, an energy strategy that's worth calling a strategy. But the point about the energy system today is we find ourselves more and more in a level playing field with the old producers. And they themselves are consumers. Uh, the Middle East is the third largest consumer uh, after Japan, uh, after China and India, for example. And we, the consumers, who thought we were uh, sentenced forever to import more and more oil and gas from the outside, find to our surprise that technology is giving a gift of more and more self-sufficiency. And we make the point really clearly that the answer to this is interdependence and a global approach to energy security problems. And we feel that if we are active, as I try to intimate in the Russian Eurasian area, in the tough cases, or if we're active in the Middle East cases, we'll be hearing about those in a moment, uh, and we have a, a global view of what energy can do for us, uh, then uh, we will not have the past four decades of dependence since the Arab oil embargo, but we'll be able to embark uh, on a new strategy uh, which will go to the benefit of ourselves, our partners, our allies, even in the tough cases that we face. Thank you, Jan. I would note that yesterday the President did mention Ukraine in the State of the Union speech. He didn't mention Russia. I'm not sure when a President's ever mentioned Ukraine before in the State of well, the Union speech. Well, there was a certain H.W. Bush who did it in Kiev, you remember that? <laughs> That's right. We won't go back to that now. <laughs> Julia. Well, that's interesting. Um, Jan did cover a lot of ground, and I guess um, I was just thinking in terms of the U.S. engagement in this region, and certainly he argues the U.S. should be more engaged with Ukraine. Uh, I think certainly the Europeans are the ones that are the most um, immediately touched by the issues in Ukraine, but mm -hmm. it will be interesting to see how the U.S. Um, deals with this region after Afghanistan, because if we actually withdraw our troops from Afghanistan, in a way that will, again, limit our engagement in the Caspian and with the countries of the Caspian, mm -hmm. Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan. I mean, all these countries are now trying to stay relevant, particularly Kazakhstan, which is a, a pretty important energy producer and where there are um, sizable foreign companies, including U.S. companies, that are big investors there. In fact, it is really Chevron that drives today um, the Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian, I'm sorry, maybe eventually, but the Kazakh energy sector. Uh, Chevron is one of the uh, most important investors in Kazakhstan. Uh, but I think the changes in the region are also coming from the fact that, as Dave mentioned, that um, you know one of the uh, uh, reasons that, or two of the reasons, I guess, the U.S. was really in the Caspian to begin with was the uh, isolation of Iran. And that policy is shifting now in ways that we don't quite know where it's going to go. But um, clearly, if, if there were a deal with Iran, it would completely um, alter the dynamics of the relationships in the um, Russia-Caspian region. And we were there also to create multiple pipelines. And with the building of the BTC pipeline, you know, in a sense, the U.S. did accomplish what it had uh, really tried to be involved with in the Caspian and the CPC pipeline, which is the pipeline that goes from Kazakhstan out through Russia. And in fact, I would say that the U.S. accomplished two things. One was a private pipeline that went out from Azerbaijan, the BTC pipeline, and the second one was a private pipeline that went out through Russia. 
Now, admittedly, that doesn't diversify the roots as much, but clearly the U.S. did um, have a major role in creating options for exports of uh, oil from this region. Now, in terms of exports of gas, I think that's something that's coming up, and I know Brenda will address that, but that's really the next um, kind of uh, battle line, because in a sense, um, if we look at the uh, Russia-Caspian uh, region, uh, really the issue is that um, Gazprom is a very major player in terms of being a, a big producer and a big exporter from uh, Russia into Europe. And the next big challenger could be Azerbaijan uh, with its um, you know, growing gas reserves and growing opportunities to produce gas. And the question is, um, you know, how will that pipeline to uh, bring gas from Azerbaijan out through Turkey into Europe? And what time frame will it be built? Will there be other issues along the way that could um, delay that? But uh, and then, you know, the competition between Azerbaijan and Russia, I guess, in Europe is an interesting one because, in a sense, what happened along the way is that Turkmenistan became a competitor to Gazprom in China. And one of the reasons that Gazprom has been slow off the mark, I guess, to be able to penetrate the Chinese market is because um, Turkmenistan got there first and was able to create a pricing framework that isn't necessarily as high as the framework that Gazprom would like. But one of the things we can't forget is that Russia is the largest oil producer in the world today. And in fact, you know, I, I look back on, um, as analysts, you know, we were always trying to predict what would happen with Russian oil and gas. And, you know, five or six or eight years ago, um, uh, there was this view, would Russia really be able to produce 10 million barrels a day and hold the production at 10 million barrels a day? Well, it seems to be that Russia, yes, can produce 10, and 10.5 million barrels a day was its average production last year. It seems to be the projection going out now that Russia will be able to meet this high production level over the next few years. And even for gas, I think the a few years ago the question was, can Gazprom really produce the necessary gas? Now the issue for Russia is that it has a lot of gas. And as Jan mentioned, uh, Novatech, a private company, produces gas. Rosneft produces gas. Gazprom produces gas. There's so much gas in Russia, they just don't have the markets for it. And that's really the issue is markets. And the major market for Russian gas right now is Europe. And uh, clearly, Russia wants to hold on to that market. And I think the battle over Ukraine is as much about the battle for um, the gas networks of that country holding on to Ukraine as a gas market as well. Ukraine is a sizable gas market for Russia. And um, you know, essentially, um, then creating other pipelines that will carry Russian gas into Europe. And Azerbaijan comes in then as a competitor. And that, you know, while I think there's plenty of room in Europe potentially for um, uh, all these uh, sources of gas, I think it will be interesting to see how that competition plays out. Uh, the issue of Iran is actually quite interesting because if one looks back at 1997, which is when the US became very involved in the Russia-Caspian region, and we began to uh, try and argue for um, creating networks, even a gas pipeline from Turkmenistan under the sea in the late 1990s, we were uh, very much in favor of that. Um, while we were doing that, and while we were very much focused on this whole Western route and getting around Iran, I think that was when the Chinese began moving in pretty heavily into the Caspian region. And uh, they laid down stakes in Kazakhstan, and they laid down stakes in Turkmenistan. And essentially, you can kind of divide this region now in, in two, because you have the eastern side of the Caspian, which orients to China, and you have the western side of the Caspian, which is essentially Azerbaijan, orienting to Europe. And so the big question will be for the future, and um, even as the US is looking at this pivot to Asia, I guess is how much can Russia pivot to Asia? Because Russia has been very much a European-focused power. And it's only now beginning to see value um, in terms of uh, getting to Asian oil and gas markets and establishing a, a, a stronger presence in Asia. What we're all waiting to see is when Putin goes to China in May, uh, there's, uh, you know, there was a view that there would be a deal with Gazprom already earlier, like actually this week, one of the um, 
uh, I guess, useless that Gazprom might actually conclude a pricing deal with the Chinese, is whether in May, when uh, Putin goes to China, there will finally be a deal that is signed with the Chinese for Gazprom to ship pipeline gas to that market. Um, if there isn't, I think it's uh, all is not lost because clearly the Russians and the Chinese are forming stronger ties already in terms of um, uh, investments by uh, Chinese state company CMPC now in a large LNG project in Russia with uh, private producer Novatech. And Rosneft has uh, a commitment now with China whereby it will sell over a million barrels a day to the Chinese market by the end of this decade. So in a sense, Russia is trying to reorient its oil and gas markets to the east and trying to capture more opportunities there. But the um, question of energy security, obviously, for um, the US when it comes to this region, I think we're not as we're not dependent on Russian oil. We do get buy Russian products, uh, refined products, but it's not as critical for us as it is for Europe. So I think the reasons the U.S. may not have been as much involved in Ukraine is because you know all of that affects us indirectly, but it's not as much of a direct effect as it is for Europe. The relationship with Russia, I think. And Angela knows this very well because she studied, studied it closely. But the U.S.-Russian relationship has a lot of problems. And Putin was just in Brussels this week. The European-Russian relationship has a lot of problems. So I think what will be interesting going forward is as this, you have this major oil power sitting in um, uh, the Russia-Caspian region, which is Russia, major gas power, and its relationships with both um, the Europeans and the U.S. Um, have deteriorated considerably. Uh, it can't figure out what to do about China. I think that's what we're all trying to figure out. And that is the big market um, in the East. So I suppose I'm just throwing out all of these ideas because as far as U.S. energy security goes, and uh, Dave did mention this, you know, we have our own oil and gas and in North America we're pretty secure. But there is this whole other world out there of countries that um, are big producers and that are basically trying to make sure that they can uh, secure their markets um, in probably some of the same places that our companies, which are big producers as well, will be going. And they, the Asian markets are really the big markets. So I think I'll end on that note. Thank you very much. Brenda? <laughs> Hey, good evening. Um, I'm going to start with a few um, discussion of a few of the theoretical aspects of the book and then talk about how some of those are relevant for Iran and the Eastern Mediterranean and also a little bit of the um, Caspian region. Try to do all that in 10 minutes. So a big theme of the first part of the book is how difficult it is to predict anything in energy. And most books, I would say, except for your book and Dan Jurgen's books, have a very poor shelf life in energy. By the time they come out, if they're talking about a specific case, those factors are already gone. But this book, the 2005 version, this version as well, it manages to give you actually some structures, some factors. How do you how do you guesstimate or estimate uh, energy trends? And if we look at, for instance, um, in the past year, the IEA has has changed its 30-year forecast BP as well. Uh, twice is, it, twice in 2013. Um, so if the 30-year forecast changes within a year, then we don't really have a 30-year you know forecast. And the book talks about this as well. The, doc, the book talks about, for instance, the surprise. We were talking for years about energy going from east to west. And who can imagine that now energy, the big players are energy going from west to east. And that's, that's a discussion. Who, who could have pred predicted that? Um, who could have predicted, for instance, that the United States would be beating Europe on climate change? So with no talk, no policy, just actually happening through technology, through, through, through the, and actually through the private sector, not through government. Who could imagine in Europe, um, even three years ago, that natural gas consumption would be going down, coal, coal consumption would be going up, Coal, coal consumption together with renewables would be going up. Who could, who could have imagined this kind of combination? This is actually 
through extensive policies and intervention brought to those kind of results. So it, it, it's, it's quite um, um, interesting. Who could have imagined when we were doing the BTC, the Baku Tbilisi Jehan pipeline, that we had this the tremendous alliance in place between Azerbaijan, Georgia, and Turkey. And the whole question was, was there going to be the demand in Europe, the investment in Europe for, for this oil and for the, the gas pipeline going next to it? Today, we have no problem about European support investment from European companies, but Georgia and Turkey, big big question marks about the orientation, stability of these of these of these countries. Who could have imagined this uh, ten years ago? So when we try to understand these trends also, not only do we not is it very difficult to an anticipate these trends as you point out in the book, but how do we interpret these trends? So let's say for instance the rise of, of North American, Canadian and American production new gas discoveries in the Eastern Med, uh, in, in West and, and East Africa, so new ga gas in new places that we didn't have before. Half of the, peop the analysts in the, in, the, in, the, in the business are talking about, well, this means actually LNG market, its market is going to start looking like oil markets, become globalized, in interconnected, um, no, no short-term short uh, spot market, no long-term contracts, right? But actually, if you're going to have a lot more pipeline source gases available, maybe LNG is going to become sort of a boutique type fuel because we're going to have pipeline available. And actually, maybe LNG markets are going to, are, are going to become even more uh, long-term contracts, more compartmentalized as we have more pipeline options. So, so the same, the new, the new volumes can lead you to actually very different conclusions about what markets will look, at, look like. Oh, for instance, the outcomes of liberalization. I love that word because who could be against liberalization, right? Are you, you know, who's for you know consolidation or you know something? But, but uh, um, it, Europe is is it looks at the American example and say, hey, these guys went to marketization of oil, marketization of gas is going to be a great thing. Well, the only difference is in the United States, the largest producer of, of natural gas supplies three percent of the American market. We're in Europe, basically three three suppliers that are outside of Europe, each supply a third of the market. So there's nothing that, that Europe doesn't look like the United States. So, so what, is it, what hub pricing is going to look like for Henry Hub versus what it's going to look like for Baumgarten is going to be a very, a very different thing. Um, and how will it, will, it, will it have difficulty as you had in America if gas prices to incentivize very expensive gas, because it's probably one of the directions we're going, where there's a lot more gas a lot more oil, but a lot of it's going to be a lot more expensive um, than in the past. Take, for instance, a little, you know, the, what is the meaning of the, the, something that sort of went through our, through energy analysts, not a lot of noise fanfare about the, the, the decision not to have a, a FID on Stockman, a, one of the major fields in Russia. Well, this decision not to decide was a very important decision. It means that Russia isn't sure, as Julia pointed out, that what, what, is there a market in Europe, and isn't there to put expensive gas in place but actually, it means that when economic growth comes back to Europe, um, that gas won't be available. So the market, the market doesn't doesn't plan for for future growth. Um, and what will these hubs look like? That in the United States, you have pretty strong rule of law. You have a variety of companies. These hub, even in the even in even in the United States, we've had also. This is something that most of the energy analysts have, haven't been able to deal with because it's so scary. But we've had a whole series of of discoveries of manipulation of, of energy data, um, especially even with the oil price, which we thought was the most transparent and, and, and price, price at all. I, very few people have written about this because it's just too scary. It's like sort of sort of like a holy cow here that we don't even really know. What if we can't really rely on the on the, the on the on the oil data? But what are hubs going to look like when Gazprom is still the biggest player in the hub? You know, and, and can just shove gas into those hubs, and so you're going to have something that looks like free market, but is it really going to be um, um, f uh, free market? And again, as as some of the previous speakers put out, there is no level playing field when 75% of the oil and gas reserves in the hands are, are in the hands of national companies. So you might have these beautiful rules of the game set out by lawyers, but actually uh, with half the players with, with a very different uh, playbook. Um, a question that maybe I would say if I was going to have a small critique of the book, of course, I don't have any criticism of the book, but um, <laughs> the one that we have to be very careful that the US system, well, it might work here, it's not very applicable to most of us guys out there uh, in the other world, where there's, where there's uh, this is such a big market with so many different players, um, and when you try to apply a lot of the lessons from the US to other places, it doesn't uh, work as well. And I think there's another thing that I, you know, I hardly hear the word 
utility anymore. Uh, energy, and especially natural gas, electricity, we used to call these things utilities, a public good that public has the right to access to, has the right to an accessible price. Um, and we should be, as much as we're happy about what the private market has been able to do in shale gas, we should remember that also without government and putting the infrastructure in place, having a vision, having a policy, and, and, and the two of you said this quite well in the last chapter when you talk about, this is actually what I did this weekend, which is kind of sad just to read the book. But, uh, but when, you in, when you say in the last chapter, when you say in the last chapter, you know how, how you actually want government, to ha U.S. government to have a, you know, a vision and coordination uh, on, this, on this issue. And I think we should remember again that it, the gap the gas and electricity, and maybe even, you know, it's funny, we don't think of oil as utility, maybe in some ways we should think of it as, as a utility, it's something that we have to think of government having a role. So a few short comments on <laughs> regional issues. Um, I think we should talk, I think what another thing I like to praise in the book is that it talks about oil and gas, bo both oil and gas, where most books that talk about energy talk about oil, when actually really oil, security of supply has been solved a long time ago, we're only question of security of price and gas. Natural gas is so much more interesting because it's so much more political because of the the permanent infrastructures that that, that move it around and the and the, and the high uh, production costs. Um, so first thing I praise for talking about gas. I'm going to so, so so most of my comments regionally are going to focus on on gas. So first thing, we're in the riskiest period we've ever known for for natural gas. No one can tell us what will be Europe, Europe's demand in a year, three years, five years. Chinese demand in three, five years. Uh, we didn't understand uh, U U U U.S. demand. I remember one of the most interesting uh, points I heard on this was that Dan Jurgen spoke in Malaysia at the International, International World Gas Conference and said that you know shale gas was happening for 30 years, not abroad, not in Malaysia, not in the East Med, not in Iran. Here in the United States, taking transparent loans from banks, hiring American companies with rigs, and it took the EIA 30 years to, to recognize what had happened in the United States. So 